I host a space every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 noon Eastern to talk about developments in the world of UBI and meet with the people who are making them happen. I'm Scott Santons. I've been researching, writing, and advocating for the concept of UBI for the last 10 years. For those new to the concept, UBI stands for Unconditional or Universal Basic Income. It's the idea that every individual in a society can and should be guaranteed a periodic cash payment without means test or work requirement in order to make their way in the world upon a firm foundation. I recently started the Income to Support All Foundation, or it's a foundation, which provides support to projects that aim to make UBI a reality through research, storytelling, and implementation. You can learn more at itsafoundation.org. I'm joined today, as usual, by my co-host, Conrad Shaw and Josh Wirth, co-founders of Comingle. Comingle is one of the first projects we're promoting at the ITSA Foundation. Josh, can you tell people what Comingle is all about? Comingle is a money sharing app that allows people to pool a percentage of their income into a community fund that gets divided up evenly and distributed as a weekly basic income. And the result is that members give money when they have it and get money when they need it so that no member ever goes a week without income. You can learn all about it at commingle.us. Conrad, yeah. you want to talk about our where we're at with the development? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, we are just plugging along at this point. We had a, the, some of you might know we had a successful crowdfund in September and October of last year, which raised about $80,000 and also inspired couple other decent sized grants so we got we got some funding runway and we've been diving back into development with an eye to still try to um, release publicly uh, by the end of this year if possible and we've had some good developments good news of late nothing we can share yet but uh, while we're keeping our heads down working but um, it's it's seeming promising for for the year and I'm excited to uh, you know, bring this to the world as soon as possible. Thanks, Conrad. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm excited uh, at the potential for what's going to what's going to happen this year, and uh, can't wait to to share with everybody and um, yeah, just see where see where we're we're all at here at the end of the year. It makes me uh, think a little of I just posted something of that effect because we had some good news. The other day and now that twitter can act as our just sort of expression of you know our inner monologue i went on there and i said i'm feeling optimistic about <laughs> the future of ubi this year and people are really hungry for that there was a lot of people that were like really that's good to hear what do you what are you what are you hearing about it and there's a lot of dis <laughs> disillusion in the ubi space i think a lot of people really loved the idea whether it came in through the yang gang or whatever and sort of have become disillusioned. So I think there really is an energy there, just like suggesting uh, the possibility of bigger things happening kind of perked some ears up pretty quickly. That actually leads in uh, really nicely into the news I wanted to uh, spark things off with today. And it was just as I, you know, put all this together and kind of, get a, you know, what is the news that, that would be good to talk about. It just it seemed clear that that over the past week, the uh, the kind of the 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 main kind of development is just there's just been multiple uh, political announcements in, in regards to based income, and that's just very interesting to see. You know, here we are, and you know we're we're two states into primary season and. You've got, uh, you know, people uh, aiming to be president. You've got people uh, looking to win their their seats again in uh, the House and the Senate. And, and it, it's, it's interesting to see that the basic income is actually, you know, part of this uh, kind of political agenda with people signaling that they support it. And it just seems it's definitely more than usual. You know, there's... Uh, in previous elections, it, it's kind of like your your kind of up and coming candidate that really nobody knows about. You know, maybe they'll run on basic income in order to uh, you know build up some excitement around you know someone someone new. 
Uh, and those are kind of heroes that were basically saying, yeah, I know I'm not ever going to get to have a chance to win, but I'm going to interject this idea into the conversation right. to normalize it, you know, and they're, they're doing very unrewarding work for a very higher purpose. You know, I, there's a bunch of them that have been out there relentlessly campaigning and it's miserable to be, to be, to be campaigning and also know you're going to get your ass kicked uh, to make sure that the idea gets implanted in people's minds in a good way. Yeah. And I would say that even, you know, even if they, they don't win, then, you know, a lot of it is putting pressure on people, um, you know, I- I existing incumbents and, exactly. uh, and for them to, to uh, express their support. And that's what I seem to be, that's what seems to be happening uh, right now, uh, as far as these existing uh incumbents expressing support. So with that, I think the, I'll, the first one I'll mention uh, along these lines is uh, Adam Schiff in California. So I was surprised to see that he has uh, expressed support for uh, basic income pilots in his platform. So, you know, he's looking to be the, the new senator in California. And uh, it's it's just you know, he he had a um, uh, he had a, a funny tweet that that's how I noticed this recently. It was just uh, you know, last week, and uh, it was like Fox News was reporting on his uh, Senate agenda, and the the piece says or the you know the 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 graphic says national right to abortion, uh, cancel fifty thousand dollars worth of student debt for every borrower universal basic income and raise corporate tax to 35%. And he shared that image and said, don't threaten me with a good time. <laughs> so then I looked at his uh, uh, platform to see like, does it like, okay, I, I assumed just off the bat that Fox News was being um, not exactly accurate in their reporting in regards to support for basic income. So I was like, okay, so what does he actually support? And he, uh, he lists, the um, uh, a pilot program. So it says here, uh, looking at his actual platform, uh, in 2022, the state of California proposed a guaranteed income program, a form of universal basic income that will provide 25.5 million in grant funding to seven pilot programs across the state. Another recent pilot project to provide $750 per month to individuals experiencing homelessness proved successful in increasing positive economic and health outcomes. That was the one in uh, LA. We should create a federal grant program that would allow states to experiment with UBI programs, particularly those focused on mothers and families in low income communities. And then it goes on. Uh, but so this is essentially, uh, you know, this is like, we're seeing more people, uh, more politicians express support for this pilot funding. You know, that was something that Dean Phillips uh, had also uh, expressed his support for that I spoke about recently as well. And then you've also had uh, uh, Cornell West also saying that we should do pilot programs. And uh, it just, you know, it's that easier lift to say like, hey, let's just test this thing out. And so whereas previously, like even when, when Yang was running on a full UBI, it's not like a bunch of other people were saying, oh, let's, you know, do a, a, a federal pilot program uh, instead of doing that. It was still just kind of too too much. Uh, but now you're seeing incumbents actually uh, saying, yeah, let's, let's test this out. So that's encouraging to see. Um, it's interesting, too, to, to kind of, I guess, speculate a little about their long-term strategy. Like you talked about Dean Phillips and... You know, his you know expressing interest in a pilot and considering a pilot, it seems ca- sort of cautious and political, but also, you know, saying he proposes a carbon tax and a dividend, which is essentially a small basic income, sort of aligns with um, how I imagine if I were in a position of running for office of kind of like easing the idea in, you know, uh, building the infrastructure for a carbon tax and dividend necessarily sets up the ability to add to it and turn it into a full-blown UBI. So it's, I, I kind of yeah. feel like that's the way it has to go. Uh, so yeah, I was, it's uh, very I was encouraging really to learn about that too. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was, uh, 
yeah, to 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 yeah, leading to that next, uh, that that is also some news I wanted to to cover, is uh, you know, it's it's, I think that he should be leaning into that more. Like he, the, the those who are supporting of a, a carbon dividend, it would be nice to see them actually framing it as EBI instead of kind of hiding it. You know, they, they're just oh, we're for, I'm for this carbon dividend proposal. And, you know, it's all about like pricing carbon and, you know, meeting our climate goals. Whereas, you know, that's great. Um, but also, you know, go ahead and just, you know, reach out to the people who actually want you to support UBI and say like, yeah, I actually do support the small and immediate UBI. And I'm, I'm kind of torn on that. And, uh, you know, in terms of political messaging, if it, if it, if the way to get it in is to sneak it in as a as a you know a, a straightforward no nonsense sort of climate initiative that gets us all paid and and not bring up the term UBI in context of it and that makes people more open to it without their preconceived notions then i you know i'm open to that as a political strategy as well it doesn't have to have the the label on it for me i mean i'm not going to be shy about saying this is a UBI and I like it, but yeah, I, I don't know what would, what would be the most effective um, nationally. I'm yeah, sure if, you're gonna, if you're going to make that strategy, sure. But also it's like, I don't even, I don't even know if Dean Phillips considers that he does already support a UBI, you know, like, I don't know if he sees it as a UBI, despite being a thousand dollars, you know, monthly payments. I feel like he kind of, I feel like he kind of has to, or else someone like slipped it under his radar too. <laughs> like <laughs> he's buddies with the Yang, so I, I feel like well, it's got, he's got to know. So he did. It, it's not even something that it is part of his platform, but he was actually a uh, original co-sponsor back um, when it was in mm. the 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 twenty uh, the the previous Congress. You know, so this was. It's not even the most recent one that was just reintroduced in this Congress. It was the one before that. So this was, he was a co-sponsor back in 2021. And so, you know, he clearly supports monthly payments to everybody uh, funded by uh, a carbon tax. But then when it comes to, you know, talking about basic income, he's like, well, let's go ahead and test it, you know? So I don't know, maybe he thinks, maybe he's one of those uh, who believes or, that uh that basic income you know requires like a certain amount like maybe he doesn't consider that to be a basic income because it would be you know hundred dollars per month or something uh instead of a thousand dollars per month and maybe he's thinking well let's test out the thousand and this isn't you know smaller thing as dbi i don't know but i saw uh, his uh, you know, i saw did. his reaction to you uh, on twitter where he was you kind of called him out for asking for more trials um, and it was kind of refreshing to see that he was like, oh, you know what? I actually will go and check out the data on this <laughs> that you pointed to me. I was like, wow, somebody will actually do that. <laughs> so that, that was kind oh, of nice. Cool. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if that changed his opinion or his approach or anything, but uh, just the fact that he was like, you know, willing to take that into consideration that many, many trials have been done already. Yeah. Yeah. That was uh, when I first heard about that. Um, his his like talking about it and that was yeah that, that was like a i don't know like a month ago or i don't even know it was a while ago it feels like but um since then like since that time he does seem to have uh you know softened and you know or warmed to it let's say to the point of of you know expressing it and even like in the debate that he had too he you know mentioned the um you know that basic income as as like you know part of it so basically, like, hey, vote for me because I, you know, support basic income pilots as like part of this, uh, you know, answer. So yeah, it's just interesting to see. Yeah, yeah, it seems Scott kind Santons. of uh, yeah. puppet master, <laughs> political puppet master. <laughs> He's working behind the scenes through Twitter. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not going to take any credit uh, <laughs> for that, considering like how it heavily involved Andrew Yang is uh, has become in his campaign. So he certainly mm. seems to be. You know, if anyone has his ear, it's Andrew. Uh, yeah. I think that's probably more realistic. It does seem like there's a place in like the 
political races now for like, you know, the people that are just, they pretty much know they're not going to win. Uh, if they are going in and they are campaigning, like, why do they need to even care if their ideas that they're throwing out are electable? You know, it's, uh, you could really just come in pretty radically and actually say what you really want. Right. And, you well, know, there's, without yeah. worrying that you're not going to get elected because you already know you're not going to get elected. Like, it seems like kind of like a good little way to like have a, a, a platform beyond yeah. just like, I need to elevate my own political stature. And that's a great uh, introduction to the next bit of news. All right. Which is, well, hey, but uh, before you get to the next bit of news, I was thinking... We forgot the level set for one thing, so I just want to let the people in the room who don't know, we generally open up some probably earlier because we don't have a special guest, but uh, in the second hour to conversation with everyone here. And also, I wanted to point out that our good buddy uh, Carl um, has shown up and suggests that we throw him up here as as a as today's impromptu special guest and. Let him join in on some of this stuff because he knows everybody and everything about UBI. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah that'd be great. Yeah, send him an invite. Yeah, I did. So, okay. uh, yeah, so along the lines of what Josh was just talking about, so uh, some other news that Marianne Williamson uh, added UBI to her platform. And so unlike the others, this is like the first one um, in a you know presidential platform, this go around that has like an actual basic income, as in she is uh, requesting or suggesting $1,255 per month, um, universal, everyone, you know, in the US. And that is the uh, poverty line amount. So this is a, you know, poverty ending uh, basic income as proposed by her. She did not get into any details as to, you know, any taxes and, and, and changes to go along with this. She just has expressed that, um, you know, basic income is way to, the way to go. So here's actually Very what cool. she said in her platform. Um, and you can find this like on her website. Uh, as president, I will support a universal basic income program uh, to do just that. When we pass my UBI plan through Congress, every American will receive a monthly check that will keep them above the poverty line. Let me be clear, monthly cash transfers cannot on their own solve economic hardship. We need other policies too, from universal health care to free public college to affordable housing. We don't want to give people cash just for it to be swept away all in one medical procedure or one college course. For that reason, UBI is in a cure-all. However, by giving everyone a guaranteed income in addition to treating things like health care and higher education as public goods, we will abolish poverty, end our crisis of economic despair, and finally have a population whose economic life reflects the prosperity of our GDP. And, you know, she goes on um, sure. and she, she, part of the detail of her, UB, her plan is that it's actually separated into three programs, uh, one for children, one for seniors, and one for working age adults. And uh, she says for children and seniors, their existing programs I would modify and for working age adults, I would create an entirely new program. So what she's you know looking to do as part of this um, is basically do the End Child Poverty Act, which is the um, existing bill in Congress that would uh, essentially it would be it would do universal child allowance and the amount would be um, set at like the 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 poverty uh, amount. Uh, you know, for each additional household member according to poverty line. So this is like, that is how you would uh, end a poverty uh, in combination with the adults only, you know, UBI too. And then you've got the seniors that would be boosted. So yeah, so it was interesting to see that um, be, you know, part of, of our policy. And I think that goes right into what Josh was saying as in, you know, this people were, from the very beginning when she announced uh, her economic platform and it was missing basic income, and yet it was part of her economic platform. Uh, the last time around, people were saying, you know, why isn't this part of it? What are, you know, why, what, what are you doing? Why don't you, uh, have you turned against basic income? Like, why isn't it here? And, um, you know, she responded multiple times that, that she supports basic income, but she sees it as like this, temporary thing 
and um, you know other things are more important. And yeah. so it seems like you know that this is this feels like a like a long shot kind of like last minute kind of thing where she might as well you know express her support for this uh, again and and see what happens. It sours it a little bit, but it's good to hear her at least doing yeah. that. I feel like so we have a request from Stephen Boyle, who's got Marianne Williamson on her thing. Do you want to let him chime in with a few words while uh, we're on the subject of his favorite candidate? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'll uh, uh, add him as a as a speaker. Okay. Hey. Um, hey, Stephen. Hi. I've been a Marianne supporter since, you know, early last year, and I supported her back in 2019 when she was running to. Um, mm -hmm. So when it comes to UBI and basic income, the way I see Marianne reading this is, yes, we need to make sure everybody has a living wage. And yes, UBI can bring people up to poverty, but they do need a living wage. There's an awful lot of other things in addition to um, UBI, such as the housing. You know, it's in her Economic Bill of Rights, uh, which she modeled from FDR's, you know, economic uh, or his uh, Bill of Human Rights. So I think that when we start looking at the piling up of all of the social benefits, she truly has a much more socialist platform than most Democrats would run. She is what uh, Bernie Sanders was running with as far as a platform years ago, but she's updated it to some of the current needs that we need right now. Um, affordable housing is sliding uh, so rapidly right now. Capitalism is reducing the amount of for affordable housing. Um, there's yeah, I think I agree with with all of this. I think it's a question, especially on this channel, you'll find is that a question of priorities where if in moments uh, UBI takes a backseat or falls off the platform because the perception is that these other things are somehow more important to do first, that's what I would disagree with. I feel UBI to be the most foundational of ideas that not only supports people at a basic level, in, in whatever way they choose, but also creates a foundation for these other programs to be built upon. It's sort of like the, the basis for taking a lot of the burden off a lot of these programs. So for the period in time where, where it's not uh, up there with all of these other things that I agree we need, I feel like that is a, a misstep in terms of, of policy. I don't know about political strategy. I, see what you're uh, I don't really know what what works up there so i don't ever fully blame anyone without knowing what they're dealing with but to 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 put ubi in the back seat i think is is really putting the cart before the horse i think that in i i wouldn't say that it was on the back seat ever i think that it literally was what else is there and do some exploration because i think that she's much more exploratory with where her platform needs to be for it to support all people I don't know if that's okay. understood or not, but it's kind of like, okay, so you have a, a, you're doing a puzzle and you start working on it. You start finding yourself focused in one area and it starts moving and it starts covering the whole puzzle. But the thing is, is sometimes you need to look over here like, hey, I got this big area over here. I do need to worry about that over there that's working. You know, that is going to be what works, but I also need to work on this over here. How can I bring them all together? Yeah. It seems sort of, sort of like an app metaphor where it's like different approaches to the puddle, puzzle where it's like, for me, it's like, why work on that giant blue s sky rather than working on the edges first and then you know, working in from the edges, you know? Right. But uh, yeah. I guess it's a priority question. So uh, rather than be dismissive, I think that it's, it, and I'm really glad that you guys have, have brought her up in conversation because she has been, uh, really the only candidate that I really think is truly behind UBI in a significant way. Um, she may not, and she's very uh, hurt by what happened with Yang as far as his alignment with Dean Phillips. 
that's just very cutting mm. because I think that she and Yang, based on the 2020 uh, run, formed some pretty good bonds. They they talked an awful lot. They talked about the future of the forward party. Um, so I think that there's definitely some hurt going on as she's watching Andrew cater to Dean Phillips. You have thoughts on that, Scott? I just take it as Yang's always been a pragmatist and he looks at the numbers. You know, he defines himself as a numbers guy who's got a chance at this point and has also got a platform he can get behind where she's more Marianne's numbers aren't aren't there right now. She's more of a I don't know. She's more of a humanitarian and, and when it comes to if you wanna do the you know, we can have the numbers saying that people feel good, or we can actually have people start coming forward and saying, that's going to work for me. And I think that that's what we got to work on. We got to work on, on seeing the humanity in the platform and not just like the numbers game. The numbers game has to be there. And I don't, I don't want to really call it a game. I want to say these are vital numbers for survival. Um, and when we talk about carbon footprint and things like that, yes, these are vital things for survival. When it comes to her platform on uh, climate action now and making sure that everybody has a job, when we start moving into a green economy, we start creating all kinds of abundance. Yeah, yeah. okay. But, so uh, I, I would just say that, you know, I, I, I want to make sure and and um, you know, report on and, and amplify when you know any candidate uh, comes out in support of, of basic income, uh, especially a basic income actual proposal and, and not just a pilot. Um, but also, too, like I do wish that that she would have done this sooner. Um, you know, because at this point, New Hampshire just voted, and uh, was it so? Dean got uh, what almost. 20% and uh, Marianne got, was it like two or three? Uh, I think that's what it was. Three or four, something like that. Some, something like that. So I don't know, you know I, I'm sure she'll, she'll continue on for a bit more, but I don't know how much longer she's going to stay in the race. I don't remember when she dropped out last time, um, but you know, clearly she's not going to win um, but it's great that she's, you know, it, it's great to use her opportunity as a candidate to push, you know, policies that we should be, you know, pushing for as, as a citizenry. So, uh, um, it's also I, obviously I think, upsetting think that I would like to see both of them on the debate stage with Biden. I mean, it's obviously upsetting that this discussion is being squashed at the, at the, you know, DNC level and they they have to sort of, you know, skirt through the back alleys and try to get the message out rather than, than, you know, doing it in the right forum. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It would have been, it would have been great to see, you know, some primary debates again and, and actually discussion of policies and, and issues and whatnot. I just like to watch a video of all of them sitting around trying to make a puzzle together. That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah, a, a new style of debate. Like, I'm voting for the guy who's doing the edges. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very interesting uh, idea. Yeah. It's like Joe, Joe you've thought. been Joe, you've been working on that bird for an awful long time over there. <laughs> <laughs> I think you got the beak upside down. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, so the uh, the next thing I want to mention too, and this is uh, again yet another uh, uh, proposal by a representative and so this is uh robert garcia of california and also interestingly this is again from california which makes sense because california is the state with like the most guaranteed income pilots going on this is you know this first one was in stockton and then the mayor michael tubbs of stockton founded mayors for guaranteed income and you know we've had pilots go at the a smaller stage um, local and then go up to statewide so there's just a lot of activity in California. And uh, now uh, Congressman Robert Garcia has introduced a bill uh, to provide uh, basic income to uh, all foster youth aging out of the system. 
And this would be a uh, you know permanent uh, publicly funded program where uh, someone aging out of foster care uh, receives a thousand dollars a month uh, for five years. And you know this is this is a a specific group of people who you know really finds um, it like very challenging uh, to exit foster care. You know they don't have parents like so many other people do. Um, you know they have to go on this on their own. They've you know it's a it's a huge transition from the foster care system to being on their own. And um, you know there's just there's a, a lot a lot larger amounts of poverty and homelessness and uh, you know unemployment and you know everything in this group. So this group uh, this actually started with a, a a similar like pilot at the in Santa Clara County, and it was actually from the result of of um, a meeting between Giselle Huff. Uh, of the uh, Gerald Huff Fund for Humanity and a um, you know local representative there in Santa Clara County, and um, they decided you know this would be you know great to be able to do um, there at that that you know super local level, and it, it did great. And then um, he went on to uh, statewide office, and then there was a, a larger program there, and. Um, this kind of program too has is uh, has started in other cities and um, also in Wales. So like this is crossed uh, across the sea um, to Wales, and they have a big pilot for for those exiting out of uh, of foster care there as well. So it's just interesting to see that this is a particular demographic that has some you know potential legs, uh, whereas you know a lot of us may you know look at say the child allowance as being you know a, a nice step towards basic income and how that exists already like in in canada with the canadian child benefit and so you know what other demographics can you cover where there would be fully universal among that demographic and um, youth exiting foster care seems like you know that could be um, one of those demographics it was interesting. It was actually, uh, I was doing some research for an organization about effective messaging. And so I, I kind of go back and forth on this. Uh, it was actually something that you shared with me, Scott, as that I looked at, um, where in terms of like the, you know, the child tax credit and things and um, being effective in terms of translating into larger movement for basic income, there was some some cautionary statements that it doesn't necessarily work to push too hard on a universal basic income based on what is like a more targeted basic income to a group that is universally understood as a deserving group, right? Mm -hmm. Children, no one thinks children should have to work for their money, but that doesn't necessarily translate to, you know, a, a working age, able-bodied adult. And so pushing too hard on that can can backfire with large populations. At the same time, you know, while I don't think we can necessarily say, look how well this will work or this is working once it's up for foster youth, um, it, does it does push the conversation forward. Of, okay, it's working for them. Who else could it work for? Why not all of us? Yeah. I just, I think it's important for people in the movement not to assume that if A, then B is a logical progression in a lot of people's minds. I think people draw very strong delineations between types of people and one of the one of the great uh, narrative shifts that has to happen to get the public to open themselves up to something like a basic income is that is is the breakdown of the breakdown of people that we all have that inherent uh, need for empowerment that inherent deservedness or however you want to frame it that um, that these these groups who have enjoyed that status you know without without uh, uh, a fight to have for a long time. Basically, it's like, how, how can we push it without assuming that everyone's just going to accept, you know, CTC, therefore UBI? I wonder if, like, I hear you talk about that, and I, I pretty much agree, but uh, I wonder, is it necessary? Do you think people really do, do you think that shift has to actually occur, like where you, the sort of sense of universality has to exist 
uh, as in order for people to accept the whole idea of UBI as a policy. Like, or do you think, or do you think maybe it's possible it'll just sort of like slowly erode through like, you know, each group becoming recognized as deserving, you know what I mean? Like, I, I actually think, I think your second part of that premise is what it has to be. I don't think mm. we have a sudden shift and everyone's just changing their mind. I think people learn what they see, right? I mm. think get, that's why I like sneaking in a, a carbon tax credit without calling it a UBI uh, is a way to kind of erode that in a very dramatic way because people see it in action, see how it's working, see the impact, see how people use the money. Um, yeah, I, I think the educational leap of trying to get people to rethink how they view the world without showing them something different first is maybe politically impossible, if not incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. I mean, the way I look at it is, you know, I, I really, instead of thinking about it like a, as a deserving group, I really just think that, you know, the important part is that you've got all these people that get $1,000 a month for you know, yeah. five years and to be able to yeah. show what happened. You know, and oh, it turns out that they had all these better outcomes. And I, it's those outcomes I want people to focus on and say, like, oh, like, look how great that worked. And, you know, why don't we do that for more people, especially me? <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, that is the other part of the research <laughs> that, that really that they found that to be effective is instead of pointing to other groups of people that should be helped, uh, make it personal. Like, what about you? Like, I think yeah. everyone can kind of relate. And so a lot of the framings around, you know, rather than security framings of like UBI is a thing that helps protect you from bad luck and all this stuff, which kind of gets people's brains going on. And like, well, but maybe they screwed up or maybe they made poor choices. Uh, the framings that often work a lot better are UBI is something that empowers you to make choices and to push for what you want and to take risks. Because um, then people kind of put project themselves into that situation. What could I do with it rather than what would someone else do with it, which is, which is sort of just conducive to pre preconceived notions about other people. Yeah, that's ultimately what people need to see is themselves in base income. And, you know, until that happens is... And it's already like a barrier is whenever you say, um, you know, that basically it's a good idea, you'll have so many people say, well, you know, I won't get it. And even though it's universal basic income, it's like they still aren't seeing themselves in it, even though the argument is that it's for everybody. Uh, so that in itself is already like a challenge um, more so than I think it should be. Uh, okay, so next up in the news... I'll, pretty much along these lines that even, um, so this is another demographic, but this is also, you know, good news in regards to a pilot. And this is that the, uh, the Denver based income pilot has been extended for another six months. And, uh, you know, for those listening, uh, we actually had a space uh, previously with Mark Donovan, who is, uh, you know, has founded and running that pilot. And um, so that's definitely something to listen to if you're more interested, uh, if you're curious about this, um, the, the Denver pilot. But uh, yeah, they got an additional $5 million. They got $2 million from the city. And uh, they got uh, a couple you know, donors, big donors, to, um, to provide another uh, you know, large donation. So Colorado Trust. Uh, was one of their big donors who put in another million and then um, an anonymous donor doubled their contribution with another uh, two million. So uh, this pilot or program that, uh, you know, they just released the six month results and it was a year long program. So um, they expect it to be a year. Now it'll be um, 18 months. Uh, so that's that's exciting to see that, uh, you know, we'll even get to see even um, you know, more data from this aside from the obvious of being this is even, you know, longer amount of time for these people um, to stay unhoused and to make sure that, you know, they're in a position where they can um, keep being housed um, when the, the uh, program ends. And hopefully, too, that, you know, this larger, longer time and more data could, again, uh, help 
encourage the local government in Denver to actually maybe do some kind of you know permanent program like this as well. Yeah, it, this this is one of the examples that's really exciting to me. The the one in uh, Florida too that Kevin is doing with the recently released. There's you know there's there's sort of like a way that pilots can go. It feels like where they do their first round, um, just sort of with the intent of seeing what happens and and then letting what happens happens. Mm-hmm. And then there's the pilots that kind of have a vision for the you know phase two, phase three, like a, an expansion into broader and more public policy that you know it might not get picked up, but when it's there and in place, and then the reception is good in an area, seeing it get sort of escalated to the next level for round two is uh, incredibly encouraging. Uh, and yeah, you know, what they're doing in Denver is is really fun to see. Yeah, uh, I, I also hope that other cities follow suit in other countries. Like, um, uh, if there's a possibility that we'll see some kind of of uh, of similar program, like in the UK, and uh, you know, I'd love to see that actually happen, um, and directly inspired by you know what the success that Denver is seeing. Uh, so next up is a uh, another pilot. So this is these are. Um, some fresh results. Uh, I actually just read these results today, but they came out a few days ago. And this is um, the results from the uh, the pilot in Austin. So this is a you know Texas pilot, and this was a, a year long. Uh, was a uh, hundred and thirty five people. Um, through you know again this is households so you know 135 people and 135 different households uh getting a thousand dollars per month for 12 months and the um the final report was uh just released so let's see kind of headline stuff they uh reported uh significant uh housing security improvements um you know just people uh, were able to find better housing and um, hopefully that that continues as well. Uh, of course, most people are always wondering about what happened with employment. So, um, see, I believe I'm not looking at these exact stats right now, but uh, I recall, I believe it was a nine percent. There was a nine percent decrease. Nine um, percent of people reported uh, working less. And seven uh, percent of people reported working more. And uh, of those who reported working less, um, half of those uh, uh, spent that time upskilling or in the hopes of getting a better job. And the other half um, chose unpaid care work at home. So uh, again, this is a very typical finding where you just don't see any significant um, decrease or increase in work, and that uh, you know any like decrease in in work is really uh, about some kind of investment in the future, be it uh, being a student or um, you know gaining skills uh, for a better job, or you know doing uh, unpaid work at home. So some of the breakdowns of these numbers too, uh, I'm looking at those right now. Let's see. So there was uh, at baseline, uh, 24% reported being employed full time, and that went down to 22%. And uh, part time went from 24% uh, up to 28%. Uh, Self employed full time, uh, no one in this. Um, was self-employed full-time uh, at any point, uh, but there were there was an increase in self-employed part-time, so that went from 12 percent uh, at baseline to 18 percent, and uh, there was no difference in full-time care work. That was 14 percent at baseline and ended at 14 percent. Uh, part-time care work was started at zero percent and went up to eight percent. So it's like the um, uh, that kind of care work was really about, uh, you know, kind of a small decrease in full-time employment and uh, just spending a little bit more 
of that. Uh, and I guess that that's also too, that's paid care work, sorry. Uh, unpaid, unpaid work went from 6% at baseline to 10%. Uh, there was no change in unemployment. Uh, there's no change in students. And uh, uh, at baseline, 4% reported being retired. And then uh, at the end of it, 2% reported being retired. So I guess some people came out of retirement uh, through that. So yeah, that's, that's Was the there anything thing. that surprised you at all, all these numbers? Or is it sort nope. of in line with everything we always see? Yeah, those are those are pretty similar in order to what we usually see, just some kind of small increase or decrease in yeah, in uh those kind of shifts between full time and part time and whatnot. Just nothing very very dramatic. Um let's see. Food security also increased and that was uh, very significant. Uh, let's see, so these numbers were uh, at baseline, 76% reported uh, not being able to afford to eat balanced meals, and uh, that went down to 59%. So that was a big improvement, and uh, same thing with skipping meals, went from 47% to 39%. Uh, so there's just, yeah, good improvement there too. And I think most interestingly, perhaps, where, and they even did like a separate report on this, was um, they saw uh, that just people uh, like became more, uh, like felt more connected to the people in their neighborhoods and the places in their neighborhoods. So this was like a, like a strong community impact uh, effect. And it was kind of, kind of interesting how it, it's, it's, people didn't report feeling like better connected to their, um, friends and loved ones like that was there was no impact for those like existing close relationships but what it did do was improve these like not so close relationships where people actually uh got to know their neighbors better and like felt more connected to their communities and um a lot of that actually was helpful um in like you know finding uh new jobs um, you know because of how important that networking is and you know just in general, we know that that's such an important impact. Like imagine if, like if the only thing that happened from based income um, was that community uh, communities became like tighter and uh, that you know, people felt more connected to everyone in their neighborhoods. Like clearly that would have strong impacts on, you know, things like mental health and crime and everything else. So seeing that kind of impact um, like that to a surprising degree was, I think, very interesting. I think polarization too. It makes me think, I've been, I think I recommended it to both of you guys already, but I'm, re I'm reading this book uh, that is more about like building strong culture in businesses or, or like team sports organizations or whatever, like these, these smaller groups. And it's looking at like really cohesive and uh, effective cultures um, and, and what they do, uh, and a, a big part of it is this this sense of connection, this sense of sort of psychological safety, like you're you're part of something bigger, mm -hmm. and this sense of responsibility to each other, which sort of unlocks the potential of of uh, group group performance. And the whole time I'm reading this, it's like this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to do like you know be the Google or the uh, or the the Navy SEALs or the whatever the other examples were the this San Antonio Spurs of like nationwide cultures where we have a basic system that lets everyone know that we've all got each other's back. You feel closer to people, and I think one of the biggest problems we have uh, that most would agree is polarization. Isol isolation, tribalism, all of these things are very, very exacerbated by this, this feeling that you're kind of in it for yourself and you got to protect you and yours rather than we all got each other's backs. There's a level of trust which comes with accountability that if we could, you know, sort of develop this culture across our, our actual national culture, 
what what could that mean? I mean, just the way we interact with each other as a society. Yeah, we're all in this together. I, I, I wish if if just people felt that way, like that would just have so many like impacts across society. Just that that general feeling of that we are in it together, yeah. that we're all looking out for each other. Instead, we've gone in this other direction of like, obviously, that's not possible because I know what human beings are like, and you right. know. Don't don't tell your kumbaya shit to me. It's like, well, but also, <laughs> if it's possible not to be suspicious and fighting and distrusting each other all the time, wouldn't isn't that worth trying for? <laughs> you know, it's been done before in certain circumstances. Why don't we kind of try to do that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, but the book is called The Culture Code by Daniel Coyle, if anyone wants to read it. It's, it's going to make me a way better coach for my recreational men's league soccer team. I'll tell you that. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up is uh, yet another uh, proposal for legislation. And uh, this is in Colorado. And, um, and I think this, this proposal is uh, at least partially inspired by... Um, uh, the program that, that you just mentioned uh, earlier, Conrad, um, the, that Kevin Scott did in Florida with the recently incarcerated, um, you know, helping them make sure that they could actually essentially afford to stay free instead of uh, go back to prison. And, you know, there's, uh, so there's a couple of these pilots focused on those um, released from prison recently and you know, looking at the impact on uh, recidivism rates. And before these pilots, there was actually uh, kind of this, uh, uh, we saw this in a couple other places during the pandemic as well, uh, to a smaller degree. And so whereas the basic income pilots are, are looking at you know, monthly payments of, uh, you know, be it, a thousand dollars or seven hundred or you know whatever this amount is monthly for a year year and a half whatever uh, this proposal is really just to do uh, a one-time payment uh, upon release um, although it, that could vary too because these aren't these details aren't set in stone yet it could be um, it could be two payments and then like one could be like conditional on something in the, um, and then, you know, then there's arguing of, well, you know, we shouldn't have a conditional. Uh, so it, it could be multiple payments or it could be one payment. But the main thing is that they're proposing $3,000 per person upon release um, instead of the existing 100, you know? So right now people just get $100 in a one-time debit card and they're told basically, you know, hey, good luck. And, uh, you Jesus know, Chris. clearly <laughs> the outcomes of that are terrible. I mean, recidivism rates are just absurd. Um, they're, they're like, and, also, you owe us $5,000 for your stay. So we'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> right. So there, it's, it's encouraging to see legislation looking at this and actually running the numbers as being, okay, so we're spending this amount on recidivism. And um, recidivism could largely be because we're not giving enough resources on exit. And so, you know, what, what amount of recidivism could, reduction could we see per some amount of money increase? And then how would you compare that to, you know, the, uh, the amount of that increase and this, the savings from the reduced recidivism? So, yeah, I just find that very encouraging. I, I hope that, um, you know, Colorado is able to, uh, you know, get that passed. And I hope that it's, uh, you know, as unconditional as it can be. And also, I think I would prefer it to be multiple payments instead of just, you know, $3,000 and good luck. Um, it would be nice yeah. just to, for people to feel that they've got some more money coming down the road well, they should, uh, a little bit they later. They should look harder at Kevin's thing and Just Income's thing is where they did front load it. Right, uh, it was like eleven hundred the first month, and then right, it was a large amount. Right, the first month because you know it's harder up front, but you also need that heartbeat of security, you know. And it's you're just getting out; it's hard to know like what to invest in. Yeah. Yeah. So that was uh, that was Colorado, and 
Let's see. So another thing I'm excited about uh, that that happened in the past week, or I guess didn't really happen in the past week, but I was just reminded of it again in, in the past week. And that's that the, uh, let's say that the hype around Francis Ford Coppola's new film is uh, starting to build. His new film is, uh, um, uh, shoot, just for, <laughs> uh, me not Metro Metropolis. Uh, no, 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 Megalopolis. Megalopolis, yes, yes, yes. Adam Driver. Yeah. 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 So the new film is uh, Megalopolis. And um, so he, he totally, he self-financed this. This is like his, uh, really his, his vision, his project. And um, I was originally excited about this back in 2019. So, uh, you know, it's crazy. It's already been almost like five years since I, I first heard about this. I got excited about it. But um here is uh, here's what he said in, in an interview back in 2019. Uh, just uh, see there in this interview, um, the interview said, there's an accident and you have an architect trying to rebuild the city as Utopia and a mayor trying to stop him. Uh, Utopia in Greek means the place that doesn't exist. Personally, and I say this with great sincerity, I believe it can exist. I believe in the genius of the human species and its ability to come up with solutions to all the problems that plague us. But the biggest problem of all is to get those people out of the way who like it the way it is because they're already in a perfect situation. In other words, there's already a whole group of that control petroleum, so they're never going to get rid of petroleum. But we have the genius to make a society. The script talks about what that society is like. My movie is about utopia. You know, like so many films today, Mad Max and everything, the future, even in some of the gorgeous films, is always a terrible place. To me, when I was a kid and saw the shape of things to come, the future was a great thing. It's what we all wish it could be. When I went to Disneyland, I remember the thing that just knocked me out was the Monsanto home of the future. I wanted to live in that house. People get scared and worried about AI, and that's how certain people gain power. Now that's with self-driving trucks that supposedly will put people out of work, but they don't say the other half, which is that maybe more people will become paid citizens who will get out of employment. You'll get a check not as a worker, but as a shareholder of the country. Why shouldn't you get $70,000 a year as a dividend from your great wealth of our beautiful country? You could if some people don't gobble it all up for themselves. So in other words, the fear of losing work isn't the issue because you'd be able to do the work you love. That's what my script explores. So I'm really excited that Megalopolis actually could depict this um, potential utopian future, this really optimistic, hopeful future where um, a base income is actually part of it, where people are actually uh, receiving some kind of, of dividend as, as citizens and it actually empowers and, and enables this, uh, you know, just better future. People doing the things that they love, and doing, you know, better things and, and less harmful things. Yeah, this utopian sci-fi is definitely an underexplored genre. I I would love to see some really cool stuff. That's the the stuff that I was most yeah fascinated with as a kid was even in like in any of the sci-fi that was largely dystopian was like the potential of the of, of the good stuff that that that's what you gravitate to you know um and to see that more fleshed out rather than most of the attention into like the systems of power that we know today getting ramped up in some to some level of absurdity what about the systems of potential and creation and connectivity being ramped up to a level of of greater beauty and i think people are afraid to write those stories in the same way that people are afraid to, you know, express pure joy. It's just, it can come off as naive uh, and, and simple, but um, we need, we need more of that. Yeah. I, I, I was a, I'm a huge fan of, of these movies that, uh, and shows that, that paint like this, um, you know, better future stuff like you know gene roddenberry in star trek like that was i feel star trek has just been it just really it, it did something different in in big and in, in regards to like our 
collective consciousness of like, there's just so many people who just think about that the future is going to be a Star Trek future. You know, it's almost like assumed by a bunch of people that, you know, that's the way that, that things will be in candy. And, uh, and of course you've got other people who, you know, just cynical and, and thinking that we'll go down the, the Mad Max and Hunger Games road. And, and, um, there's like this, this, I don't know, lack of participation or feeling of, of being able to impact these things where like Gene Roddenberry pointed out this great future, but it's not like that was just going to happen. <laughs> you know, like you, we, we have to make that future happen. We have to choose that future. And it's really hard to choose a future if you're not seeing them depicted. So I'm, it, it, we need more stuff like, like this. And I'm really looking forward to Megalopolis um, to, to paint this future that we so desperately need to, to see and believe is possible in order to, to make it possible. Yeah. Well, and the fact that Francis Ford Coppola struggled for over a decade to make this really makes it clear that how hard it is to make <laughs> yes. stuff of this nature, visionary stuff. I mean, I, I don't know any of, if any of you out there are, are in film, but guys, it is hard to do something. And most people uh, tend to spend at least most of their careers, if not all of it, trying to make something that they think can sell or working for people that have a budget on what they want to do. And so I, I, I believe that, you know, in a UBI world also, it just opens up our art to be way more honest, way more optimistic, way more uplifting, or way more creative because we're not deciding what, how we want to express ourselves based on, you know, I still got to feed my kids though. So how much can I get away with? It's more like, no, what do I have to say? That's what I'm going to say. Um, it's interesting that he yeah. had to finance the whole thing himself. Like if you want to, if you want to paint a pretty picture of the future, you better have some money to do it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. yeah. And, uh, and, and encouragingly, I, like the article that I read uh, about this recently that, uh, you know, re re reignited my excitement was just about how, how, um, you know, Adam Driver was talking about how this was the greatest experience that he's ever had being on set. And he explained it as, as being, you know, it was from the fact it was so different in being like, this was the director, like his vision and something he really wanted to do. And there was no, you know, corporate kind of involvement of, of doing this or that instead. And, and, you know, this was like, this is like the true vision of the director and if it does well. And so like, this is, this is key, you know, so like, first of all, we want it to do well, or I want it to do well because I want more positive stuff. But also, um, if it does well, then it actually modify the way that these things are going, uh, because more people would want to actually there, there. There's more profit potential in like actually trusting a director with their vision, and so you could potentially mm -hmm. see more of these director vision led projects that are funded to the director uh, by people backing the director instead of the traditional process. Yeah, I day once when I was in the pit of despair about some independent film I was trying to make that was my vision, um, and you know nobody knew who I was or would you know you have to have certain sorts of backing. Sent me uh, some statistics about um, you know the the success rates uh, and profits and things of movies that had new directors versus movies that you know had hired directors. Um, just sort of along more of an algorithm and the new directors working towards visions that were their own and their creative visions blew the competition out of the water. That doesn't mean that, you know, Netflix is, is going to start, has started shifting to that. In fact, just the opposite, but it is validating of the potential. And with bootstraps, I mean, that's, uh, we're, we're, we're like over seven years into that epic process of trying to make something that has like a pure vision that we had. And we've gone through, I can't tell you how many meetings with people who are like, oh, we love this project, it's really important, but we're only funding things that, you know, have a celebrity with his shirt off or, <laughs> you know, uh, it's a food contest or it's a sports doc. Or, it's like there is no money to be made in it. And part of that might have been a blessing, although it was like a curse that, you know, we lost years of our lives to trying to get this funded. We, The fact that we eventually got the amount funded that we have 
in, in grants and no strings grants meant that we could build it the way we wanted and it meant it could be something incredibly special. And anytime we were in a phase of trying to pitch to these higher powers of funding, um, we were basically instructed by our pitching partners to stop creating, let it still be manipulable, because they're going to come in and they're going to tell you what it's going to be, and it's going to be this many episodes, and you're going to cut half the stories. And it's like, and, and just sort of deliver to us, it's like, this is just the way the business works. And it's like knowing inside this will kind of ruin or greatly diminish our concept. Uh, I'm almost glad in retrospect, although uh, still bitter, that we had to do the hard work of finding funding that didn't that didn't take over our project and tell us what, you know, the billionaire financial uh, apparatus yeah. thought it should be, you know? Yeah, I don't know if we could pull this off, but I would I would love to be able to get uh, Francis on here <laughs> and, and 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 you and he could uh, also like even <laughs> could. talk about your experiences. Because mm -hmm. it's just interesting too to see how that, how similar that is in like, like the only way to really to get something done the way that you envision it to be done is self-financing and and yet also part of that is just a greater timeline you know like mm -hmm. if you if someone funds you then bam you can turn something around and get something you know done within a year or something um right. but if you're self-financing then that is a process that's a slog. it's your life life's <laughs> work yeah no i've definitely written francis's name down as uh, someone to to be my like 4051st uh cold call out to a celebrity <laughs> but um i did i think date a distant cousin of his once like 10 years ago in new york city so you know maybe i've got an in you've got an in that's gonna do it <laughs> it was a nice date although it didn't, didn't go anywhere uh -huh. <laughs> yeah i just hope this movie's not ugly like dracula it's i think that's gonna be key you just gotta make it look cool like you, you can have a vision for the future but if it's like bad art direction you're in trouble <laughs> yeah, I, I I have faith in he, it. He has definitely screwed down, up right. before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's yeah. clearly it's something that's very important to him, and it, it really yeah, is. About that's not always a great thing. Future. Like if somebody's like a big like true passion <laughs> project can sometimes backfire in a big what way. What was it? Uh, like sometimes was... you do need like a, a uh, some kind of production company being like, you know, maybe we, let's try this in a better way. Like, yeah, yeah, I, mean, I can't. Remember. It happened with. Uh, he, he's good friends with George Lucas, who like decided to go off on his own and make you know some movies by himself, and we saw how that went. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, what I'm trying to think of that movie that like d destroyed um, like someone's like career essentially, uh, where yeah, is it Terry were... Gilliam? Maybe. No, no. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'll oh, the Don Quixote thing. Yeah. Yeah, it was it, it was talked up as you know, it was their their big passion project and yeah, it was just it was uh it was a monstrosity. I just don't remember uh what that was. But I just remember yeah, I watched a video essay about this before. It was like an example. That's that's why when you at first said I almost wanted to throw in a caveat when you at first said I that you hope it does well, I have like a different order of operations where I hope it's good and then <laughs> if so I, I hope it does well. <laughs> right. Otherwise I feel there's all these movies that get all this buzz and then I watch it and I'm like, am I crazy? Is everyone crazy? It's like this weird, like, is, is the marketing just, is, is that all I'm seeing? You know, it just <laughs> makes me feel like I don't have a sense of anything anymore when a movie that's not great, it does really well. Well, yeah, the thing I'm, I'm thinking of too is, uh, like, I, I feel the last kind of, of really optimistic uh, kind of utopian uh, take on things was Tomorrowland, and uh, that did not do well. Uh, and uh, like I enjoyed it, and it, 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 like when I recommend it to people too, I, it's kind of like, well, so watch it for like the message, and it's not like you know the, the greatest movie. It's 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 fun, um, but uh, so it was it was uh, written and directed by Brad Bird. Uh, who also did Iron Giant, and I, I love Iron Giant, and I also did Incredibles, and I love that too. Um, but uh, I, I, Brad Bird is one of those people that I feel, you know, is kind of it, along these same, same lines of how, like, the future can be better. And, like, the message of Tomorrowland was basically, 
um, like by creating all these dystopian films and, and TV series and stuff, but it's actually making things worse by, by leading us that direction and by actually like having these more positive visions of the future, that that is what, how we actually get to that more positive vision of the future. So that was like the message of the film. And I think that's a really important message. And yet clearly that message, you know, either the message didn't resonate or it did, but then like the movie didn't resonate. Uh, but either way, you know, it's not like that was, you know, a, a blockbuster kind of film and hardly anyone has seen it whenever I recommend to people. They all ask yeah. me, have you seen Did this? You, uh, like, no. It's still on my list since you recommended it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you see the, uh, the, the one, Hello Tomorrow on Apple TV? The, uh, it, it's, like, it's a cool, like, retro sci-fi look to it. But it's I, didn't, I didn't watch the whole first season. I got through... Uh, like, yeah, it's a little slow, but, episodes. like, the... It's a different take of like, you know, selling optimism as a way of like just selling it. And it's sort of like it speaks to that whole idea of like optimism being like a self-fulfilling prophecy. And it, it's it, it works. But mm -hmm. it, it's like it was a, not sure if it was like, a, you know, funny or or serious or it was one of those yeah. that was having a little bit of a hard time figuring out what it was. But I, I think it, it does fit the fit into the conversation pretty well. Okay, yeah, I did so, have hey, some quirky moments. We should do a quick pause and say one. One, um, I see Angie up there, and she's probably waiting for us to say, uh, suggest that people tweet and post repost this um, to get more people in here if you feel like it. And then also, we kind of got caught on that movie tangent for a while, but this is usually when we open it up to people. If you want to talk about anything we're talking about or ask a question, um, request to speak, and we'll bring you up. Yeah, I see Carl is, uh, his, his invite is still pending. Um, I don't know if he, if he's listening or, or knows that he needs he's, to accept the invite. He, uh, he pinged, he pinged me on the side and said he didn't really have felt like had much to say. So if okay. he does, he'll, All right. well, he'll, you just, he'll join. You just listen, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's see, I guess next, uh, it did. I, I like that article about his, his, dog that was pretty good. <laughs> um can you repost that if anybody has a handy because it's pretty funny yeah, yeah. Uh, we could actually just read it because it's short right it's, it's really it's really short it's it's really brilliant um yeah, if you want to find it uh and and read it then you can go ahead and and, and do that i'll try uh, until uh, well that's uh well conrad's finding that article uh i do want to mention like one other news piece that I thought was really interesting. And, uh, and this is, it, it's, it's not actually about basic income, but you know, when you, when you hear what this is about, then you'll see that there's of course a direct connection. And it's that a, uh, a new study found that, uh, that not only major stressful experiences such as bereavement, uh, but chronic challenges such as financial strain were uh, detrimental to help. And so this was a, uh, you know, a big, uh, they used like a, a big longitudinal study and uh, they looked at uh, like four different uh, biomarkers in blood. And uh, like they, they categorized people as, as low risk, moderate risk and high risk uh, in terms of health. And um, they found that uh, that people who reported financial strain, um, you know, the perception that they may not have enough financial resources to meet their future needs, were 59% more likely four years later to belong to the high risk group. So th that's like a, a huge impact of financial stress on physical health. And, you know, it's, it, it, I feel that there's a lot of people who doubt that where, you know, I'll share something about how, you know, basic income leads to better health and, you know, less crime or something. And, you know, people will say, oh, well, you know, that's not going to do anything. That's just, you know, money or whatever. And that's not going to, that's not going to help like reduce cancer rates or heart disease rates or these things. You know, like you can make people feel a little bit better, like mental health wise, but you're not going to impact their, their physical health, like you're not gonna 
um, you know, prevent someone from dying of cancer or whatever. But we do see that, like we see this in the data that financial stress is a big, is a big stressor and stressors actually lead to poor health and it actually increases, um, you know, potential for all these other, um, you know, afflictions to, to, to impact us. And they actually, even in the study too, they looked at genetic predispositions and there was no difference. So it's not like there was a, a genetic predisposition that was um, combining with stress in order to put someone in a high risk group. It was regardless of genetic predisposition, uh, financial stress led to a, a large likelihood of being in this um, um, high risk group for, for poor health. So yeah, I just thought that was a, a really interesting finding that just further supports um, you know, the importance of the, of the security of base income, which is things mm -hmm. people will discount, you know, that's, that's why like a, a lower amount of base income can actually still really be surprisingly impactful is that it's not so much the money as it is like the ability to know that, you know, in the immediate future, you'll be getting more of this money and that you can plan around having that money and you can depend on having that money and, that ability, that feeling of security uh, really reduces stress. And by reducing stress, you see all these other uh, better outcomes, uh, not only for health, but that's also, you know, can lead to crime and, uh, you know, child abuse, spousal abuse. Like a lot of these yeah. things happen as a result of that. Well, it also just kind of feels obvious that when you're, when you're worried about money, your body just feels shitty, you know? <laughs> I'm at my wit's end. I'm trying to wrap my brain around what I can do next. You can't take that nice centered breath that like people at fancy conferences all talk about and attribute their success to yoga and stuff. It's like, no, you don't have time for that shit. You're trying to figure out how to, how to feed your kids. You're trying to figure out how to pay your rent and not get evicted. And so it's not just that you're not exercising. It's just, you can't, you can't s slow down and sort of exist in your body and, and breathe in it. You're, you're just kind of, you're kind of, you know, animal in a corner sort of situation when you're financially strapped. Yeah. There, there's an article that I, that uh, I've wanted to write for a long time, which is uh, it's just like a collation of like all the times that I've seen participants, in basic income pilots say the words uh, along the lines of, I could breathe. It's just that there's this, it's just like a, such a common analogy, uh, this, yeah. this metaphor that people feel. And it's just, it's the best way to explain it. They, they experience basic income. And then they, and when asked to describe it, they just say it was felt like I could breathe again. Yeah, it's a great metaphor, the breath in general. Like it also brings the nutrients in a regular interval into your body as you need them. You know, it's just... It's just a life-giving thing that we take for granted. Yeah. Did you find the so uh, I, the dog I, article? I found it. I All found right, it. So here is your reading. I, I, I look forward to Carl's uh, critique of my performance later. It's called <laughs> Reciprocity and My Dog. The belief in reciprocity, the belief that when you take, you should give back, causes big problems for my dog. She gets food and shelter from us but she can't understand that all we want in return is for her to hang out with us. She wants a job, so she's taking it on herself to protect my wife and her territory. She growls, barks, and lunges at dogs she perceives as a threat. She's always on the lookout. She shows obvious signs of stress. She and my wife would be so much happier if there was some way to make her understand that she doesn't need to do anything to, quote, earn her keep. We've taken her into our house to be our friend. We have, therefore, taken on the responsibility to make sure she's happy and her needs are met. Uh, and here's a picture. It says, my dog, whose name is Happy. Um, it's not that the principle of reciprocity is wrong, but she can't see the very complex way that it is fulfilled. Humans have taken the natural environment, made it impossible for dogs to live on their own in nature. The only way humans can make a, a reciprocal payment to dogs for taking their resources is to make sure their needs are met in some other way. Reciprocity is fulfilled without our dog having to perform any job at all. There could be a lesson here for the basic income debate. Workers of the world, relax. 
you've earned an unconditional payment because wealthy people took ownership of the world's resources and all the property we make out of them. Reciprocity demands they owe you compensation. Won't people receiving the basic income feel the need to give back like my dog does, even if the payment is already reciprocal? Most of them probably will, but people are smarter than my dog. They can figure out ways to contribute. And unlike propertyless people today, they'll have the resources they need to get started. <laughs> I, I I linked it in the posts too. Right. If people want to share it or read it again, yeah. What what I love about that is it's kind of like a you know simple distillation and and twist of like how usually people would say that you know like dogs get food and and shelter because you know humans are are nice enough and you know we want them to you know be our pets or whatever and they're essentially there's like a work requirement, you know, where, where, or a job guarantee where dogs are actually performing this job. And because they're performing the job, they're getting this food. And like, that's the, you know, that's where like the, where, how they deserve it or whatever. But when it comes to uh, like, when it, like Carl's argument here is just basically saying that, you know, we, we destroyed the ability for dogs to be able to like wander around and, and eat, you know, <laughs> on their own and so you know the the fact that that we feed them is is really already squaring the deal um and anything beyond that is just you know totally just dogs being dogs and and you know voluntarily loving us and and playing and and you know everything else yeah it's a pretty good question the whole i think the idea about re reciprocity in general is it's so complicated and it comes up like constantly, like it's just this sort of deep seated thing that we feel like we have to fulfill. And like, yeah, yeah. I think what are you it doing is a big me? issue. It, it, right, right. And like, yeah, you want to, you want to give me money. Uh, what do I have to do for it? Like, what do you want? You know, you know, like there's some sort of <laughs> like catch to it that, uh, and so, yeah, any kind of like, age old kind uh, like generational uh, reciprocity we have to just kind of ignore even though it is such a major factor in yeah it's how, it, we're, how we're, we live we're, our lives we're operating from this really it, it, like ignored thing that should not be ignored where you know it's almost like a it's like it, it's like uh someone like if if someone like stole uh like the deeds to our our family's land or whatever, and you know, like they 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 stole that, and um, and then like we're trying to figure out, uh, you know, or, or or someone's complaining that if they were to to be taxed or something to provide us a basic income, then that's like wrong, and so if you if you ignore the fact that that they that they took all this away from us in the first place, um, you know what Thomas Paine referred to as as you know the dispossession of our natural inheritance. If you if you ignore that, then you look at this and and go, you know, that's either taxes is or theft or it's not deserved. What are you doing in order to deserve it? But like it's operating on this this truth that's being ignored that. Um, that we were dispossessed of of a great deal you know like we we lost our ability to just go out and, and work the soil and you know build a house and and grow a, a farm on some land and you know like it's not possible you you, you <laughs> lose vision of reciprocity when it's not immediate it has a time lag and sometimes that reciprocity is owed across generations and maybe an argument of ubi is there's an inherent reciprocity in a thriving culture um, from everyone to everyone, including, uh, you know, future descendants uh, that that always exists. Yeah, I think that the future descendants part is a uh, is particularly important too. you know, it's it's uh, it's also another, like you could look at the Alaska model as as taking that into account, you know, like it's not it's not fair for one generation to suck up all the the oil from the land sell it and make all this money 
and then you know the future is left with first of all like no such natural resources to sell and also the outcomes of having you know burned all those of all those fossil fuels and so it's like a, a double harm and you know if you at least transform these natural resources into a permanent fund then it's permanent like that fund will always be there for a generation after generation after generation uh, as long as it's you know stewarded uh, appropriately but um, we don't have that you know and we should we should look at you know how to make sure that future generations also benefit instead of just you know i got mine kind of mentality it seems like we have someone who wants to chime in from uh, new zealand potentially yeah pure democracy uh, nz thanks for uh joining us today thanks for the space um in U with the UBI, um, it's uh, the 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 idea is that um, it will uplift the the poorest, uh, the most uh, resourceless, so that they can have resources uh, to cover their basic needs and to create enterprise. I think you mentioned in your story that uh, uh, that's something about that being able to create enterprise, being able to uh, create one's own income, being able to uh, be productive. A lot of people are stuck, homeless, waiting for health care, uh, trying to access um, education and so on and so forth. Um, what do you think about that? Oh, yeah. Uh, like the, the entrepreneurship effect of basic income is is um, quite large and very frequently observed. Um, even the, the most the most recent big results were out of the the Kenya um, pilot, and that's a it's a twelve year EBI pilot, um, very large, um, thousands of people uh, across um, you know hundreds of villages are are part of this pilot, and uh, the uh, the results of the first two years saw a, um, a very large uh, entrepreneurship effect. I believe it was about a third of, um, of recipients uh, started their own businesses. And in the Namibia UBI pilot, um, it was the biggest I've seen uh, of any pilot where this was a 300% a increase in uh, entrepreneurship. And uh, in the India UBI pilot, uh, the uh, the villages that received the basic income were uh, had had triple the entrepreneurship rates as the control villages, and so you you just see this over and over again as far as um, as people utilizing uh, basic income for entrepreneurship. And so there's there's multiple reasons why that's the case, uh, but they the the main ones are that first of all, basic income functions as capital. So, you know, you're able to actually, or more able to actually buy what you need to start a business. And um, there's less risk aversion. So you're less worried about what could happen if you fail. Uh, so there's, there's definitely entrepreneurs out there who feel that they have an idea and maybe they even have the capital to actually start this, but then they worry that if they fail, maybe their entire family will, you know, become homeless and impoverished. And so it's not worth taking the risk uh, to do this. So reduced risk aversion means more likelihood of actually starting something up. But I think most importantly is that basic income by being universal uh, actually creates customers. So it, you could give capital to a would-be entrepreneur and they could feel that they're willing to take on the risk and so they start the business um, but there's that business could also just fail and it could fail not because people didn't enjoy the good or service being provided it could fail because there just weren't enough customers or there weren't enough customers with sufficient uh, disposable income to spend on that and so with with basic income universally provided with it boosting the disposable incomes of anywhere from you know the bottom 60% uh, to the bottom 90%, then 
these businesses actually are able to flourish in a way that they wouldn't be able to flourish otherwise. So uh, yeah, I, I do hope that people understand that those components of basic income uh, are actually great for both new business formation and actual sustaining and flourishing of existing uh, small businesses. I think too, uh, this kind of ties back to what we were talking about before. I don't know if you were here before Pure Democracy. Uh, we were talking about the study that showed that politically speaking, you know, framing as a poverty alleviation or, uh, you know, a mechanism of security, you know, for people in hard times is far less effective politically than framing as the, as a general empowerment tool and enabling agency across the board. Um, and I think it kind of, you have to think about what that means. Is it like, Framing in terms of the uh, Maslow's hierarchy, for example, you know, people become more actualized and life is better as you move up the hierarchy, but you have to move from the bottom to the top in that order. Uh, so it starts at the bottom with basic security, basic needs, and the idea of things like basic income and universal health care is to fulfill those things as a given, not so that people just – that's not the end of the sentence where people are just not desperately poor anymore. It's what – is more important is what comes next. What do you do when you're not in that position anymore? How do you find your community? How do you find your purpose? How do you find your self-actualization? And freeing people up to be in that position, for me, is what it's really all about, as well as, you know, being what compels most people to, to support. Um, so, yeah, to me, I, I like to, the, my simplest uh, boil it down, you know, catchphrase that I like to keep going back to is that Cash is just power. Uh, it's, it's just a tool for uh, allocating resources, which is power. And if UBI is unconditional cash to people, then it's unconditional power to the people. It's just power to the people. It's not not suffering to the people. It's power to the people. Uh, and that's why you see so much entrepreneurialism coming out of all these pilots. And that's why I don't think we can fully predict what will happen when you have an entire society in which everyone has a basic level of power afforded to them as, you know, a given. Um, yeah, I well, I would, sorry to cut you short, I'm sorry, but one thing I have come to realize so far is that most entrepreneurs, they don't know how to manage, like handling of risk management once it comes to investment. They don't know they don't know how to make that decision because when you want to start a, a business it's quite difficult for you to make up your mind and see how far you want to put in resources is it going to work you're afraid of failing i think you should talk about that i really want to get some insight more about that thank you who was just speaking i just the voice changed. is that helmuth yeah i think yeah. that was yeah okay I would just say that's an issue with or without a basic income. It's just more people like entrepreneurialism is incredibly difficult. It's just that more people will have access to try, you know, right now entrepreneurialism is largely limited to the people that have some risk tolerance. My personal story for entrepreneurialism is that, you know, uh, I had had a good, you know, an, uh, a relatively privileged childhood. I got through college without debt uh, and I got had an engineering job that, the the result of which I was getting credit card offers all the time. I and I came out of it with a couple of credit cards and generally annoyed that I kept getting all this spam mail offering me free credit cards. And then I moved to New York to pursue acting and to sort of just take that impoverished life, which uh I'm trying to build something new, which was already a step of like, okay, I have enough of a of a privilege to be entrepreneurial in terms of a career change. And then when, when I started trying to create projects I would, I would, if I believed enough in a project and I wanted to get people together and start building it, um, which is the only way to move a lot of things forward, I would take out a balance transfer on my credit card. But what's a credit card? A credit card is trust from society that you're good for it. And it was a big eye opener for me living in, you know, a bunch of neighborhoods, uh, economically disadvantaged neighborhoods. It hit me one day. I would go into the bodega and get, you know, a Reese's. I love Reese's. And I would pay for it with my credit card. And the, before the guy swiped it, every time he'd say, debit, right? 
And it just was odd to me because that didn't happen other places. And I would just kind of, no, uh, it's credit. And then and one, <laughs> one day it hit me. It's like, nobody has credit cards here. They're not getting all these offers in the mail. They would love to have credit cards. And then thinking about, you know, starting my independent film project, starting bootstraps and commingle, all of this stuff started out of a belief in ourselves. You know, uh, Josh put money into commingle. I put money in. And this is money we took out on debt from a position of privilege. So that came out of a position of, of being able to take risk, feeling safe. So if you open up that opportunity for everyone in society, how many people that, you know, many people are still going to fail at entrepreneurialism because it's incredibly difficult. But how many people out there are brilliant and capable and competent and never got the chance to try because the risk was too high for what level of privilege they were coming from? And also just the number of people that it, it saying that you have some access to capital uh, doesn't say that you're going to succeed as an entrepreneur. It just means that you can actually try it. You know? And so, so I think that, you know, there shouldn't be some misconception that the, the increases in uh, entrepreneurship are over, you know, are, are always successful entrepreneurs. <laughs> like that's just number of people try it. Yeah, I think it's important to 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 welcome failure in, when it comes to you know taking a risk and and starting something up, and that's the that's really the thing when it comes to to risk aversion and the challenge with that is that you know if you're afraid to try something because what happens if you fail, then you don't do it. And the trick to finding out what actually works is to just do something and try again, then try again, then try again. And if you're able to keep trying, then you'll eventually figure out what actually works. You'll succeed if you're able to try enough. And that's what are the, one of the big challenges um, that we have today is that really, uh, you know, if you look at who are the entrepreneurs and who are the successful entrepreneurs, um, there's certainly a disproportionate number of people who have come from wealth. And that's not only because of the fact that they have the capital, it's that they're actually able to fail repeatedly. And if you can do that, that's where you're able to find the success. I think pure democracy has something else to say. Thanks. It might sound like a silly question for um, people who have uh, obviously looked at research in matters of uh, economic policy and social policy. Uh, but um, is, is there a sort of a unified model of the economy and society? Uh, are there examples of such research that, that, that produce sort of a, a, a complete model and show how um, these policies, affect, any policy affected people uh, in real terms, economically, socially, uh, and so on? There isn't because I a, believe... a good like unified model, if that's what you're asking. We're trying to build um, the first one. I can share with you my manifesto about what I think it should be. But yeah, we're tr it's kind of a it's kind of a push in the UBI universal health all that stuff world to kind of conceive of this thing that hasn't really existed, but we have glimpses of it. And that's what makes it so politically hard is we're trying to get something done that we don't really have a lot of precedent for. We have we have hints and clues and and theories, but we. Like Scott said, you got to try it out. It's it's this entrepreneurial uh, venture at a society level. But I would I say, like, sorry, I, I just made me think of something. I would say that the data is there and accessible. And if somebody was like, you know what, I want to create a complete simulation of the world economy, or at least or a local economy, any economy, but there's a pretty good amount of data that's accessible that people are putting out there that you could probably do it. I would, just caution, I would just caution that all of the data in history is based on people existing in a different paradigm. And we haven't ever put people in a different situation that changes like basically the temperature of the water we're swimming in. So there is an element that is unpredictable until we do it at full scale that we have to have the humility to understand that what we know from and the glimpses we have from the data could change as time comes. Like what happens at a macroeconomic level when you do something like a UBI is, is, is not 
fully predictable and it requires a leap of faith and to pretend that we know exactly what will happen is uh is is maybe deluding ourselves but we have done all the due diligence with the data to have a good idea or to have a good educated guess about at least why it's really worth trying you know I would say when it comes to these, you know, the, like the notion of some, you know, one encompassing mega model or something that, um, I mean, I'm, I'm really not interested in those kind of, of, of things. I think there's all kinds of different assumptions and, and models to be built and preferences for what you think is good uh, versus what someone else thinks is good, uh, you know, different goals. You know, someone might think of like, a, you know, a model that's more socialistic and, um, you know, another may think of a model that's more capitalistic. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of, of determinations to be made as far as like what we each think is is the ultimate kind of North Star of what, we, what we're looking to build. And I just think that when it comes to basic income, that it's really just a foundation or it's just this, it's this missing foundation that, you know, civilization has just not, uh, uh, built into its, you know, operating system at this point. And I just think that, you know, it needs to be part of it. And that once you have that foundation, there's all sorts of, of things we can build and, and directions we can go. Um, and uh, hopefully we have, you know, a, a strong debate as to the directions that we should go, like democratically speaking, and that there's, uh, you know, kind of decentralized decision making via people's purchases uh you know as far as like market directions that we go um you know what are people spending their money on what business are people creating um and you know how things are distributed that way but all in all we know that that as conrad said we have the we have the knowledge base of, of knowing like how how work impacts are and stuff like entrepreneurship impacts stuff like health impacts and and some of these can, things can be a little bit smaller than others and you know to the point where it's not a big deal you know <laughs> like there was an article from box uh last year that was um, just about like how really basic income isn't as big a deal as people think it is where the argument there was that you know both sides are wrong as far as thinking that this is going to have like some big impact via you know big negative impact or big positive impact it's going to have a small impact and you know in general it's uh you know better than the status quo but you know, that also could be the case as well where um you know it's politically speaking if you have that um you know the 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 lift that we can actually um get like a small base income going we have the reforms, we have the tax reforms, we have the welfare reforms and tax substitute reforms. Um, you know, it's it's enough to actually create this basic income floor, but it's also a, it potentially that you wouldn't really see that much of a difference in say disposable incomes. You'd see a difference in security and you have some impacts there. Um, but depending on design, it can actually be a very small change. So that's part of it too is to you know when we actually do this um what kind of design do we actually utilize i, I think too just a general uh good uh idea to keep in your head is that utopia is a direction not a destination so having like one yeah. you know it's always going to be adapting like from an engineering mindset you're always uh adjusting a design to fit the new information the new circumstances um, and I think it'll always be that. We just want to take those steps, you know, utopian word, uh, not ever assuming we're going to get there. But yeah. I think, yeah, is it the, the thought that there needs to be like this completely holistic, uh, uh, you know, simulation of what might, uh, might end up happening by introducing basic income, I think is like, I think that is overestimating like the impact that will like, that it'll have that like i don't think it's like <laughs> that the worst case scenario is not a worst it's not a very bad case that would require like massive modeling before we can say that it's going to happen that it's going to have a positive impact yeah and when it comes to modeling too I mean, the I, like one of the 
of course, one of the common uh, uh, concerns about basic income is is you know no matter what no matter what the results are of all these pilots, you know no matter how many positive results that we see, someone will just say, well, it wasn't large enough. You know you have to you know, there's there's no there's no actual impact at the macro level to show you know that it's sustainable and you know one cause inflation or whatever won't be lead to to crazy rising rents and, and all this stuff. And you know that's it's true that that we we don't have you know this this macro data until we actually do it. Um, but at the same time too, like so much of this is just built on the very poor understanding of like of just how much money is is going to people in a way that that boosts their income. And um, you know, this belief, the the common belief that you know, a thousand dollar basic income means that everyone in society gets an additional thousand dollars and so therefore you're printing the money and no one's taxed. And, you know, it's just very different than a model that uh, has some kind of tax uh, added that's new, some kind of tax reform, some kind of subsidy reform. There are entirely, there are UBI, there are ways of going up at UBI that are entirely deficit neutral that do not impact the, the money supply at all. And, that too could have some kind of inflationary impact just from you know the the difference from someone at the um in the bottom uh quintile you know versus the impact of someone spending at the top quintile like you're going to see more money velocity and that that could be inflationary but like none of this is really a part of like the the discussions i feel uh it, it's just like oh yeah, that's some great evidence, but it'll cause inflation. Yeah. Instead of like, what what are the details? <laughs> right. I, I try, for me, like w I was building the UBI calculator a few years ago. I really wanted it to be defensible as a very conservative estimate. Like the estimates of what might happen would be on the low end of, of you know, positive outcomes and it would exacerbate the potential, uh, you know, shortfalls of, of any proposals so that, it, it could be something to sort of educate the public without being advocacy, right? Um, and when I was designing that, in order to stick to that and doing the analysis of, like, the economic numbers across the country, costs of living, all that kind of stuff, uh, one of the decisions I made was I wouldn't allow any of the proposals to be more than $15,000 a year because up to $15,000 a year I can reasonably have confidence based on what we've done and based on just the cost of living in the U.S., that it, it shouldn't wildly change people's behaviors. But one of the things that I find, uh, at least I was more comfortable making that assumption, whereas one of the things I find different with a lot of UBI proponents is, you know, that people start talking about, like, different acronyms, like a guaranteed livable income, and everyone's definition of basic or livable is different, and some people... You know, four thousand dollars a month, uh, and and that will allow for a certain amount of education, leisure, what, and sort of just kind of a moving goalpost to the point where it's like if I'm getting fifty thousand dollars a year and I've lived in, you know, the last three decades being basically, you know, pushed around by the labor market and treated like crap, I might withdraw, and a lot of people might withdraw, and I can't say confidently that that's not going to happen. So in terms of like predicting outcomes, I think there are very important things to consider and give credence to. And like, is it, you know, based on the amount, based on the design, um, and have some caution and acknowledgement of the fact that what we are proposing is a, is a radical and fundamental transformation of how our economy basically works and that we have to do it, uh, with, you know, an empirical and humble mindset, you know, uh, optimistic, but also not completely um, in the bank for it's going to work 100% without any sort of caveats. Yeah, and I'd also just say that, that as you just, there's, there's certainly proposals that are more radical than others. <laughs> like, as, like, as you said, when it came to, when it comes to impacts, um, you know, if, if someone is proposing a, Two hundred dollar per month UBI, you know, something that commingle would would achieve um, versus a four thousand dollar per month UBI, 
you know, there's clearly um, a, a much greater difference with the higher amount as far as it being radical. And, uh, you know, I would, I would not describe a $200 per month UBI as radical. So, you know, even there, there's, there's some kind of, of difference, um, you know, some kind of debate as to what qualifies as a radical UBI. And, um, and at the same time, I, I would say that what's, that could be considered radical is, is just the fact that we are actually leaning into, uh, let's say, a, a trust-based model. And, and that's, you know, maybe we could call it like, socially radical and not so much economically radical, where the fact that we're actually trusting by default instead of distrusting by default, that I think is, is, um, is, is transformative at a, at, a, at a different way than um, I would say it would like, be economically transformative. Yeah, and I think people get tied up in the amount, but the universality, this is why the universality is so much the most important, you know, part of this idea of basic income. And then when discussing the amount, like, uh, I just, I threw an article that's one of my old favorites called Money Isn't Money into the comments if people want to have, like, a little glimpse into, like, my thinking of why basic level income is so different than comfort level income. And it all has to do with, is it disposable or is it mandatory? Um, and Carl has just done a big series of papers on mandatory labor and stuff like that too. But it's a, it's an interesting way to think where, um, you know, the first money you get is, it's already claimed. It, has, it comes with no choice. It's very different than the money you get once you've got your basic needs met. Uh, I think uh, Dream, what's his name? I see Dreamer. Dreamer or yeah. Nico. Hey guys. Hi. Yeah. Cool space. Thanks for inviting me. Um, Thanks for being here. It's accepting. Yeah. Um, I think your thinking is really, really um, spot on with the, someone said earlier that money is power and that's people power. Mm -hmm. um, I, I tend to think of it as oil in a machine. And right now it's just not circulating very well. It's being held up in um, very small amounts of places with like a huge quantity. So it's just like grinding the gears on everything else in the economy. So, um, my core, yeah, or I guess I, I would say that like part of, part of the issue is we, we've been brainwashed by the media into thinking that, that actually capitalism likes competition and it doesn't. And I think that's the reason that we don't see UBI come forward is people want to have ultimate power and control in the economy. They don't want competitors. They don't want you having a leg up or, this this sort of like a way of competing against them. So that's that's I, I think that's the biggest resistance factor to UBI. And so I'd like to kind of ask you guys where could we explore UBI outside of the the kind of like I guess the government realm. I think that's most people's um, kind of path yeah. forward. Like w where could we investigate a UBI in terms of like the technology that we have or new technologies that we could develop in the private well, sector. funny you should ask. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is all Josh and Conrad. That's exactly what we're trying to build. Yeah. We, Josh, you take it. I've been talking too much. So mingle.us, check it out. We are, yeah, it's, that, that's very much what we're trying to do is uh, just take the same concepts that exist in the UBI thinking and see if they can work on a, on a private level without having to get the government involved without all the, you know, political buy-in necessary. And it's looking good. It's looking <laughs> like it's something. We can, and, and a lot of this comes out of like the, what, what the original, uh, what I forget who it was that mentioned the idea of like doing a data model of what would happen. Uh, and it's, uh, it's be, very data driven, very based on uh, people's real uh, financial activity. Uh, we can, it's something that is we're putting out there all the time and we're spending with our different uh, bank cards and credit cards. It's, it's all data that's out there and it's not really coming back to us in a positive way. It's going out to others to be used against us and to figure out m more ways to exploit us. So um, it's also a way of kind of taking control of 
our own information and data that we're putting out there. So yeah. Just, just want to summarize the, the commingle model really quickly. Yeah, I, I want to say too, uh, Dreamer is not a plant, uh, but it is, he does, he does, <laughs> right. this is a good time to mention, I did a post in there that's some ways to get involved, which includes mm -hmm. some stuff on commingle and the crowdfund. But the basic model is it's essentially like building a governmental model. Like it's e like either, a, you can think of it either as a tax or a tithe, but everyone, you know, who becomes a member agrees to put in a uniform percentage of their income as measured by you know, connecting their bank accounts and, and, and following the transactions. Um, so everyone puts the same amount into the pot. It gets chopped up every week and goes right back out to everyone. And that has a very elegant result, which is money flows from above the average income of the group to below the average income of the group proportionally to how far people are above or below. So if it's a $50 payout and you have no income, you get $50 in help. If you had $100 in income that week, you put in seven and you get your 50, so you come out $43 ahead. If you made $1,000 that week, you put in 70 and get out 50, so you gave $20. And it becomes this sort of sliding scale basic income floor that is at $50 in this example that nobody in the entire community ever follows, falls below. And it, um, it, it's frequent and it's reactive in real time to people's uh, income situations as they change. Yeah, on a weekly basis. So yes, good question, probably to wrap things up with. I think we're at the- Yeah, we're at the hello. end here. Uh, I do, there's just one other thing I wanted to, to mention really quickly. And it was, um, I just uh, published a new article about how uh, I think China is a, a potential dark horse candidate for you know the first country to do UBI just because of the conditions uh, in China right now and um, some other factors. And uh, and then it was pointed out to me too that uh, I, I didn't I didn't realize it until um, you know after I'd published it that um, the chief economist at the Bank of China had actually um, just recently um, recommended uh, what is essentially the Alaska model in China. And so this would be uh, it, the proposals to create uh, multiple um, national like funds um, based off of the profits of the state owned enterprises and then to distribute a um, you know universal dividend to uh, everyone in China um, once a year based on, you know, the, those, uh, the dividends from the funds. And yeah, just fascinating to me uh, to, to learn about that and the potential that that could actually happen in China and um, just getting people to think that, you know, there's, that China could actually surprise everybody. And, um, you know, even just in general, what do you think could be the first country? Like, where would you put your money on being the first country to do this? Is it one that we have talked about more often or is it one that really, you know, no one is really thinking about that could be the, the first one? So uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention that that was uh, some interesting latest news. And with that, um, you know, we're at the, we're at the end. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. And if you enjoy the space, uh, you know, you can still be great to retweet it share it out with your networks. And uh, we'll also be posting, uh, we post all of the these spaces on the Comingle YouTube channel as well. So uh, check out um, previous episodes there as well if you like and uh, subscribe there. And for to stay up on basic income news, check out basicincometoday.com uh, as well to, to you know, stay in the loop on a daily basis uh, to basic income news. And, you know, Conrad, Josh, do you want to say anything before we go? Um, yeah, just check out that tweet with all the other stuff. There's It's a, it's a Foundation. Um, and also, we do this every Wednesday uh, for the most part. So if you want to do it some more, come back next week. Yep, sounds good to me. <laughs> Great. All right. Thank you for all for, for listening. And uh, just a... a to leave you with just, yeah, think about what basic income would, uh, would do for you, how it impact your own personal 
life, uh, you know, what are you, what are you not doing right now? Because you don't have a basic income and just kind of uh, think about that and ask yeah. that of other people, you know, get people thinking about it. And extend it both forward and backward and to the other members of your family. Just kind of work, work through all the angles of it and, and see what it means to you. Like, what if your parents had it when you were a kid, you know? Um, it's all interesting stuff to kind of spend Jeez, some time yeah. contemplating. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you, everybody, and uh, see you next week. Bye. Thanks. Bye.